Praise the Lord. Okay, so today we want to cover Lesson 15 of My Father's House, and it is um, Part 2 of the Gifts of the Spirit. Just uh, by way of very quick revision, last Sunday, you might recall, um, we looked at the, um, what the gifts of the Spirit are as listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we noted that there were nine uh, gifts specifically listed, and we read them and studied those. We also saw that they can be grouped into three groups, and specifically the uh, gifts that are given from the Spirit of God for us to know supernaturally. They empower us to know things uh, that we don't normally know. And uh, also the second group to uh, those gifts that are given of the Spirit to help us to act or to do supernatural things. And thirdly, those that help us to speak in a supernatural way. We covered the first group last Sunday, and we'd like to move on to our, our next group of uh, gifts that are uh, given by the Holy Spirit. And you might remember that <coughs> as we studied the first group, the to know supernaturally, we looked at the word of wisdom, uh, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirit. And we noted that there was a little overlapping naturally between some of the gifts. Usually, um, when someone is being used in the word of wisdom, uh, they also are given some knowledge. And conversely, uh, when there is a, um, a, a, a word of knowledge, there's o it's often uh, associated with the discerning of spirit and, and so forth. So there is often a connection, if you please, amongst the gifts. Um, there is a diversity within the gifts. And, and so um, it's not as cut and dried as what we presented. The Spirit of God moves quite uniquely upon each individual and in, in every circumstance. And so we need to remember that as we continue to study. In any case, our um, second group of uh, gifts of the Spirit we want to have a look today are those that uh, help us or in, uh, anoint us to act in a supernatural way, or if you please, to do things that are not normal or natural in uh, their supernatural. Now, we've defined that as, as being um, uh, uh, abilities and anointing to do that which God directs. The first one we want to look at, of course, is the gift of faith. You remember in that scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 10, we read as our introduction last time. Let's read it again. It says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirit, spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues uh, that's the list of the nine gifts and uh, let's start with faith today and define it a little bit from scripture uh, of course um, we saw the uh, those uh, discernment gifts or the gifts of knowledge and so forth that God gives of revelation these are more in the uh, category of power gifts uh, they're all powerful gifts, but these are uh, labeled as power gifts because they help us to act and to function um, in, in, in supernatural ways. Uh, in other words, to be able to do things and to achieve things that we normally could not do. Uh, faith, the gift of faith, functions on behalf of the believer to perform something impossible by ordinary human means. And I want you to see that through the Holy Ghost, God takes you and I, ordinary people and causes us to do to speak and to act and to know things in an or, you know extraordinary way and that's what being anointed in the spirit of god is all about so in, through the gifts of the spirit the holy spirit which is in itself a gift that god gives to each of us when we're first saved uh, god anoints us to be able to both know to do and to speak supernatural things we've got a couple of examples of uh, what happens here in in the uh, in the gift of faith you might remember uh, that uh, when Moses was for instance at Pharaoh's court uh, he had a plain old stick in his hand and God had shown him what to do with this and in faith he he acted out exactly uh, what God had shown him to do and that snake t uh, sorry that stick turned to a snake and of course uh, in due course not only ate the sticks of the magicians of Egypt, uh, Egypt, but also returned to being a staff in his hand when he picked it up. Um, many other examples of the gift of faith, uh, often uh, exemplified by Jesus and the apostles, uh, the healing of a man afflicted with leprosy. We find that in Matthew chapter 8. 
uh, also the healing of the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda in, in John chapter 9, and a judgment that was passed upon a sorcerer in Acts 16. Um, faith is an amazing gift, and I think it's something that um, we certainly would consider supernatural anyway. None of us have faith of our own. It is God that gives us the initial gift of faith, and it is placed in the heart of every man, the ability to believe. However, there are different, um, uh, slight differences between uh, saving faith, and I want to sort of specify that for you today, and this particular gift of faith. So let me just uh, put this up here first. The gift of faith is a supernatural ability. Say supernatural. Okay, just remember that word. In all of the gifts that we are talking about, we are talking about things beyond the, the, our nature, beyond or above what we can do naturally. <clears throat> so these are supernatural ability to believe God without doubt. Now that's a key point in, in the gift of faith, to combat unbelief and to visualize what God wants to accomplish. Now it is not only the inner conviction that sort of drives you or impels you to do and to act, but also the supernatural ability to meet adverse circumstances and trust in God uh, in His Word and the messages that come from Him. If ever you've experienced this, it's a bit of a hard one to actually put into words, but you know it if you've experienced faith in your heart. Now, when you first came to salvation, you, by faith, accepted what the Word of God stated. And that is an act of faith. It's an initial as it's an exercising of the gift of faith that God has given to every man, the measure of faith. Um, but it has been um, stated that this faith, meaning this gift of faith, goes beyond. It's an amplification of that early faith that we all have to exercise. In other words, we need faith to believe in God to begin with unto salvation. But this is a, a, a next measure, or if you please, a... a, a, a an an amplification, just that, an extra measure. Uh, somebody called it a wonder-working faith, and uh, Weymouth, the, um, one of the translators, renders it as special faith, and uh, it is uh, distinguished as special supernatural faith uh, from saving faith. Um, uh, another commentator, one, uh, Donald Geese, says this. It says it would be, uh, it would, it would be that faith <coughs> would seek to come upon certain of God's servants in times of special crises or opportunity in such mighty power that they are lifted right out of the realm of the natural and into uh, a supernatural realm uh, that puts certainty within their souls and within their hearts of triumph and victory over everything. I guess it's a next measure. It's a stepping up of faith. It's an enlargement of faith. I often like to picture it in my head uh, as a big magnifying glass, as it were, that magnifies the, the faith that's already there to just become something so certain that there is no doubt in your soul about it. Now, I, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but perhaps you have experienced this. It is a special endowment. And I know in my own life there have been instances where God has shown me something and I know it so certainly, so completely, so without doubt that I can only put it down to this very action of the Spirit of God in my soul. Uh, through faith to do something, to step out and achieve something. And it is, it is as if I know in advance, through the Spirit of God, it is a done thing. It's done. There's no doubt about it. It will take uh, place. It will come to pass. And so it has been on a number of occasions. And so you will find that, um, for instance, in um, uh, Matthew uh, chapter uh, 17 and verse 20, if you turn that up for a moment, <coughs> you will find that Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, uh, and for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence uh, to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. I think Jesus is describing this very ability to believe God beyond just the basics, shall we say. And please let me not um, appear to disparage any faith. I believe any faith is a, is a good thing before God. If we begin at any level to trust God and we exercise faith, it is a good thing. However, when God uses us in this gift, it's just like you're empowered to believe at the next level, to believe beyond doubt, to trust God in manners and ways uh, that you normally 
well wouldn't. And so it is very much a gift. And I want to say this, it is for you to receive. It is for each of us to receive uh, this beautiful gift. Perhaps I could um, uh, show you that there are two or three types of, of faith that are mentioned in the Bible. Firstly, when we come to salvation, we, are, we require what the Bible refers to as faith unto salvation. That's, we call that saving faith. In other words, you first come as a non-believer, you hear the messages of God, and, and it speaks to your heart, and faith is stirred up. Remember, it is a seed of it is placed in every individual's heart, the ability to believe. It's stirred up, and it germinates. And you're able to believe God for your salvation. You're able to believe that Jesus died at Calvary for your sins. You're able to accept His plan of salvation for yourself, and in faith, you begin to take a step. You repent of your sins, and you are baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And then you pray and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's saving faith. And what happens? Well, that is actually, uh, as it were, an entry, if you please. And it's the beginning of faith just working through you. And it is you entering into uh, the kingdom of God and eventually, of course, into heaven itself. Then the Bible speaks of a second kind of faith, which is found amongst the listing of the fruit of the Spirit. Do you remember that? And it lists the fruit of the Spirit. And amongst that listing, we find faith once again. Um, so if, if faith is the fruit, what is it the fruit of? Well, it's the fruit of the Spirit, and yet we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. So how can something be the source and the fruit at the same time? Well, it is that very way with faith. Faith is being placed in our hearts. Initially, we believe God. Once we're filled with the Spirit, the very same Holy Spirit brings forth fruit. And one aspect of that fruit is faith. Well, what kind of faith is this? Well, this kind of faith is the faith that the Holy Spirit works in us constantly to change us, to make us believe God further, to help us to trust Him more and more as we get to know Him. Remember, when you first came to Jesus, you didn't know Him very well at all. But as you walk with Him, you get to know Him better and better. You build relationship with Him. And faith grows in your heart the more you hear God's Word, the more time you spend with Him. So the initial faith to believe as it were, ushers you into heaven, into heavenly things, shall we say that, into the heavenly spiritual realm. Then this kind of faith, the fruit of the Spirit faith, is the, the faith that actually brings heaven into your soul. It actually changes you and starts to modify you and makes you holy as you trust God and makes you closer to God. Beautiful, isn't it? A beautiful process. But then on top of that is yet this faith, which is now the gift of the Spirit. And as I say, I, I see this as a stepping up yet again. And this faith is faith to believe for that which is supernatural, which is miraculous. If we can trust God at this level, if we can allow God to use us this way, we will continue to see miracles. We will continue to see the supernatural in our lives. Sadly, it is often here uh, that we fail God. We don't give ourselves over sufficiently. We believe God for salvation. We allow to some degree or another for the Spirit of God to work in us. But when it comes to trusting God for that which goes a little bit beyond our natural understanding or means, we find that sometimes difficult. So remember that this is an inner conviction. And it's not just an inner conviction, it is that, but it is uh, the uh, ability, the supernatural ability given of God to face uh, the most difficult circumstances and still come out victorious. Without doubt, I can make it. Now, we sing choruses that reflect this kind of faith. I know that I can make it. Jesus put it where? Now, that's interesting that our will is involved in the faith, isn't it? In other words, God's faith is of the faith of God, which is the spirit of, of God, the gift of the spirit of God, doesn't just come against your will. It comes within as you willingly hear God's word, as you willingly submit to God, as you willingly do his bidding, his work. So please remember that in all of our receiving from God, our will must be yielded to the Spirit of God. Okay, so then moving on to the next aspect of uh, the gifts of the Spirit uh, is the gifts of healing. Now, I want you to notice that this is given in the plural, gifts. 
of healing. Not gift of healing, but gifts of healing. Again, this is a power gift. And uh, specifically, it is given of the Spirit of God so that diseases may be removed. Now, look, we have all been recipients of this wonderful blessing at different times. I know my own body has been touched of God and healed miraculously. And I know many of you have been touched and healed the same manner. And uh, I've seen many people over the years healed by God. However, I want you to remember that in all healing and miracles, God remains sovereign. That means that God's will, His power, His, His choice remains ever above ours. In other words, God is not for us some kind of genie in a box uh, where we just sort of rub the, the lamp and express a wish and God will do what we want. It's not like that. It's the opposite. It is us going to God in faith, trusting God and believing God. And there are times somehow where the Spirit of God and our desire and our faith connects in such a way that a miracle can take place. A healing, in this case, can take place. And the same applies to the next one, uh, the next gift, if you would please, the actual working of miracles. But just to give you a couple of biblical examples of this, you might remember that uh, even in the Old Testament, God has always been a healing God. So God has never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and, for, and forever. And we find that just as He healed in the Old Testament, He healed in the New, and He heals today. Amen? In the Old Testament, we see, for instance, a prophet, Elisha, who has a man from a different uh, country altogether come to him, and this man is a leper. Leprosy was probably one of the worst possible diseases that a person could, could uh, uh, you know, be infected with. And in any case, this man came to him, and uh, Elisha simply said to him, go and wash in River Jordan seven times. Now, there was no hocus-pocus, there was no magic potions, there was no uh, magic words stated, simply a directive of God, because this is the Spirit of God at work. So much so that the man himself thought, oh, well, I thought that this uh, man would come and just you know sort of do something kind of magical to make this go away but all he did was to give a command that had to be obeyed by faith now that's an interesting clue for us for god to perform a healing in our lives faith is the key the essential element that has to be present now uh, please again uh, i know that all of us would uh, come and pray to god in faith but there has to be that connection, that special connection that we've spoken about, where at that moment, our faith has reached a level that we can trust God without doubt of that healing taking place. Again, if God has um, uh, you know, worked on your soul and your heart uh, in terms of this particular gift, you will know what it feels like. There is this knowledge, this intense desire that somehow you've got to pray for this situation, whether it's for yourself or another person. And certainly it was the case uh, with Elisha. He gave the command. Faith was necessary. And when finally that man in obedience, and that is the evidence of faith, isn't it? In obedience did what the man of God told him. He was totally healed of his uh, leprosy. There are many examples, of course, in the New Testament, too many to list all. But all you have to do is go through the book of Acts, for instance, and you will find just numerous examples of healings and miracles that were performed by Jesus and by the apostles. And so we know that healing is not an unusual thing amongst those that believe in God, particularly so amongst Pentecostals, who as apostolics believe that the power of God is the same yesterday, today, and never changing. And so remember this, though, <coughs> we become so uh, self-sufficient. Now, I guarantee that if our situations of life change, in other words, we were in hardship circumstances. Circumstances where you couldn't go to a doctor. You couldn't go and buy medicine at a chemist. And you are sick and there are no hospitals. That all of a sudden, you would have to make a serious choice. And that is to lean harder in faith on God. Amen? Now, some of us would die. It's as simple as it gets. Not necessarily because we didn't have enough faith, because somehow uh, that faith and the will of God didn't quite gel at that moment. But I guarantee we would see a lot more miracles and healings because we would choose in faith to trust God and take faith to the next level. 
And all too often, this is what we are like as humans. It's when we have, shall we say, desperate needs. When we are desperate about our need, then we tend to trust God. And not until then. And it is a sad fact, but unfortunately, it is the way we are made. I suppose that what we should do as believers, though, is practice our faith in God. Practice what God says He will, he will do. Put God to the test on a regular basis. God says He's willing to heal you. Are you willing to believe Him at that level? And so healing still takes place today. I want you to see that all of the gifts that we have spoken about so far and that we will cover, all are current today they're not something that used to happen and are now passed away god still heals today isn't that good news and so when when doctors have run out of options when medicine has failed when there's just absolutely nothing else guess what there is still god there is still faith in god and i have seen many times people who were given up by doctors and and simply couldn't be helped and not because doctors didn't want to but they couldn't the system simply couldn't go that far after all even doctors of you are human are limited but i've seen god take uh, the situation further and heal where man could not um, as believers we can have a gift given of god that will actually bring healing and healing uh, at, at different levels as we will see in fact let me state that that it, the scripture here speaks of gifts plural of healing because healing takes place at different levels See, we often think of healing only as, as a physical thing. Uh, in other words, we are sick physically in the body, and therefore we think of healing at that level. But there is such a thing as emotional healing. People can be sick emotionally. In fact, it's not unusual, particularly in our day and age, to see many who are emotionally ill simply because of the stresses of life, because of the pressures that life can bring on us. And also spiritually, there is clearly uh, some people who are sick at a spiritual level. You believe that? It's, it's evident, isn't it? And God is able to bring healing at every level. Now, let me, let me uh, point out to you that Jesus made provision for healing when he died at Calvary. He didn't just die for our sin. Uh, we know this as the double cure because not only did he die for our sin, but he made provision for our healing. The scripture says that by his stripes and with his stripes, we are healed. When Jesus took those lashes on his back, <clears throat> yes, he shed blood so that we could be healed, uh, sorry, healed of our sins in that sense, but also that we could be healed of the diseases of our bodies. It is a matter of believing God at the right level and trusting him. In any case, this gift of healing is in the plural because it can be a gift at a physical level. It can be uh, one that can help individuals at an emotional level and or spiritually. So at each level, there is a beautiful diversity and, uh, and it is rendered in the plural. <coughs> well, how do you know that God wants to use you in this, um, in this ministry? Let me say that um, all believers and, in, and in, gen in general and certainly the ministry in particular are empowered uh, to be able to be used in this gift. And, um, and I, I believe that it is, uh, you know, it is something that God desires to do more amongst us. It's as simple as that. So when you are ill, instead of reaching directly for uh, the medicine first, how about you go to prayer first? Give God an opportunity to work in your life. I've seen fevers disappear. I've seen uh, simple things like headaches go, but also cancers go. Because for God, there is really no difference in terms of His ability. Now, what is interesting, and I should uh, point this out to you, uh, that when uh, it comes to miracles and healings, uh, the word that is often translated miracle is actually the very same word that we uh, see translated in the New Testament for power. The word is dunamis. And so when God gives us the dunamis of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, He has already given us the ability to see miracles and, yes, healings done. In other words, I want to say it this way. That power already resides within you when you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's good news, isn't it? So the power of the Spirit isn't just given to us to, uh, okay, to witness and to stand strong, all of those things, yes. But it is also given so that we can act and be and do supernaturally as unto God. Not for our glory, for the glory of the Lord. Well, how do we know that God wants to use us 
uh, in, these, uh, in these healings. Well, healing can come through the touch of faith. You might re- remember in James chapter 5, we are encouraged to pray for the sick, anoint them with oil, and pray what? What kind of prayer? The prayer of faith. So again, you can see that faith is the key that opens the door to healing. And when we pray the prayer of faith, and the person receiving receives in faith, many times we have seen a healing takes place. Uh, that takes place. Also, it can happen by this, by speaking the word of faith. There are many examples uh, where Jesus simply spoke the words. In one particular instance, a man came to Jesus and said, uh, "My my servant is is sick." And uh, Jesus didn't actually even go to his place. He said, go on your way and he will be healed. And what is interesting is that that took place simply at the Lord's command. So that can uh, happen also. And one of the best places that I've seen the healing of God is actually in the presence of God. Now, perhaps it's the times when when we are praying and we're kneeling before God or just worshiping God or just that in, in church worship. It's not unusual to see that somebody is reached of God and touched and healed right there amongst us as we worship the Lord. So remember, whenever the, there is a manifestation of the presence of God, that is a very, very good environment, a very good place to believe God for a healing. Uh, sometimes you don't even have to physically ask for prayer of someone else, just simply the move of God's Spirit. If your heart is right with God and there is the healing received of the Lord. <clears throat> I know that there are some times when, and, and this has happened in my own life, where a situation has, has lasted as a disease or a condition in my own body uh, for many years. And then, and then in the right time of worship, I, I, I will recall uh, just one instance uh, that uh, was a particular problem to me. I had received some damage to uh, one of my ears, and for nearly 18 months, I couldn't stand up straight. I, I was not able to actually... Uh, keep my balance without feeling incredibly nauseous. Driving was near impossible. I went to the doctors and of course they told me there was damage to the inner ear and any time I would have a, a cold or any any effect in the sinuses that I would uh, become just like that, very disoriented and, and that, that you know, an inability to sort of, I, in fact, it was that bad that I would, I would have to lean back against the wall just to, just to feel like I, I had something solid that I was, uh, you know, standing against. And, um, and, of course, I prayed naturally. I prayed lots of times. Um, but it was, it was still there, and it didn't seem to, to happen. And then this particular Sunday morning, I remember, and it's vivid in my mind, I remember I, I got up and I felt so spinny and so, uh, you know, really uh, poorly that I, I just wanted to throw up. That's how nauseous I felt. And it was at that moment... At that moment, that I felt exactly what we described a moment ago, that faith rising my soul. And that faith said, go and worship. And it was just like I knew that if I went and worshiped God, God would heal me that day. And so I recall I couldn't drive. I, had, I was driven to the church place, to the meeting. And, uh, <clears throat> and I made myself sit at the, um, at the piano and, uh, and we, we began to worship. And as God's Spirit began to worship, move, and the people of God began to worship, no one was near me, but God was there. Amen. And, and at that time, it was like a flow from heaven just came into my soul. And uh, I stood up. My eyes were closed. Now, I couldn't have done this a moment before, but my eyes were closed and my hands were raised. And I was able to jump and leap with my eyes closed. Uh, and and I was healed. And I yelled it that way. I am healed. I knew I was healed. There was no doubt. And that condition has never returned since. The doctors don't know how, how the damage was or what caused it or, in fact, how it's gone away. But God healed it. He's taken it away. Now, I know that's only a small example. And I'm sure that there are many testimonies amongst us and of people who uh, have been healed of grievous things. But I guess for God, there's no difference. Remember, whether it's a cold or a cancer, uh, it makes no difference to God if we believe by faith. So remember that whenever, um, you know, God can use you in this for yourself and for others uh, by a word of faith, uh, a touch of faith, a speaking of faith, and in the presence of God. 
Praise the Lord. And uh, these uh, gifts or these gifts of healing belong to all uh, believers. I want you to see that in Mark 16, you will read this, that those, uh, these are the signs that will follow them that believe, it says. These are the signs, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. God has already determined uh, that God will heal, that he will heal if we will trust him at this level. So God has a gift. Now, <clears throat> the gifts are not something that we can claim as our own. In other words, we can't say, I have a gift of healing and just go about and just lay hands and, and people get healed. That's not what we mean by a gift. A gift isn't something I exercise at my own will and, and desire. It is something that I am exercised by the Holy Spirit when God wants, wants to. Can you see the difference? It's a gift. It's a, it's a channeling that God puts through me by His Spirit, uses me as a channel, uses you as a channel, uses any believer who will believe as a channel for His power. Uh, so it isn't to be understood that a person manifesting this gift as the gift to heal anyone and everyone at will. Uh, in spite of the fact that there have been many recorded healings, many a times, uh, we have never found anybody emptying out the hospitals except for Jesus. When Jesus walked the streets, it says that he healed everyone. Now, that was amazing. Of course, he is God. He was God in the flesh. <coughs> but that said, God uh, does use believers to see healings take place. And it does take faith in the, in the person receiving the healing also. So even with Jesus, if you remember, even Christ himself was limited by the faith of others. There were situations where he couldn't do as many uh, works because there was a lack of faith in those people that he was trying to minister to. So uh, let's understand this in the right context. Uh, it's a plural uh, gifts because of the different levels that it applies. Uh, and it is, in fact, uh, a glorious gift. Uh, but it is also something that God uses us in, not something we use of our own accord uh, to, our, to, you know, at our own will and whim. And, uh, and so should God use us in this, then we will see some amazing things. However, here's the key. Are you willing for God to use you this way? Think about it. It means stepping out in faith. It means God speaking to your heart and mind when you see a situation and knowing, knowing in your soul that you must act. At that moment, you're stepping in faith and God is able to help you act supernaturally. Now, you know very well you don't have this ability yourself, but through Jesus, you can. Praise God. All right. Let's look at the next uh, beautiful gift that God has uh, given. And of course, it's called the working of miracles. It goes hand in hand with, uh, with healing, uh, but it is uh, slightly different again because it doesn't refer merely to the healing of the body or curing or, if you please, bringing uh, healing to uh, mind, body, and, uh, and the emotions. This has to do with a more general work of uh, provision or protection or, in any case, uh, some amazing things that God can do. Again, it's a power gift, and it is to do with supernatural events that take place in precise timing, in perfect timing, uh, to bring uh, God glory. Now, we could give many examples of this also, of course, but here is a few in the Bible. Moses um, was uh, being chased by the Egyptian army. Uh, behind him was the Egyptian army, and in front of him was the sea. Well, people know you can't walk on water. Only Jesus did that. <coughs> and here is two million people, and where do they go? They can't go back. They can't go forward. It's going to take a miracle. And sure enough, that's exactly what God did. God asked Moses or told Moses to lift his staff. And when he did, it wasn't the staff and it wasn't Mo Moses' arm. But God, through the man, performed a great miracle. And uh, the Red Sea parted. People walked across on dry ground. Amazing. Okay, so uh, again, there are other examples in the New Testament and many, of course, that we could mention. But you might remember a couple uh, listed here as examples. Jesus multiplied bread and fish to feed multitudes. Uh, and 5,000 people were fed on. Uh, that's, that's a great way to go shopping, isn't it? Praise the Lord. <coughs> Only Jesus can do that. So the fact is, there was a young man with just a little lunch. And Jesus took that little and made it much. And what was amazing was that not only were those 5,000 men fed, uh, plus who knows how many other women and children, uh, but also uh, there were many, uh, many leftovers collected 
from that multiplication of bread and fish. This is an example. And of course, it's again the power of God to act supernaturally. In another instance, um, we find that Jesus um, calms the storm. He, he actually commands the winds and the waves to be still. And at his voice, these natural uh, phenomena, these natural things took, uh, took uh, advice and uh, they responded uh, by calming. So a miracle in itself is a performance of something which is against the laws of nature. It, it, it somehow uh, you know, contradicts the laws of nature. We know very well that if there is a storm happening, well, that storm is going to blow. It doesn't respond to our voice. Usually that's the case. But through the power of God, Jesus was able to calm the storm. We know very well that if we have two, uh, you know, two fishes and a few loaves, well, you know, uh, that's only going to feed uh, so many people. Uh, that's, that's the natural law. That's, we understand that. You have to have an awful lot more food to feed 5,000 people. But in the hands of God, that's the miracle. That's where God can take little and make it much. That's where God can uh, open the door where there isn't one. In other words, mira miraculous things can take place uh, when God intervenes. And again, it is based on faith, but it is based also on God working through a willing vessel, a willing individual. Again, let me stress that you don't kind of conjure up a miracle in your head and say, I'm going to do a miracle. It's not how it works. It is God working through you to perform his supernatural act okay so it is god's will and power so i want you to see that it is a supernatural power to intervene and counter uh, counteract earthly and even evil forces uh, so we can fight against evil ones this is not man's trickery or sleight of hand this is not playing a magic trick with cards or what have you that's not what we're talking about miracles are supernatural things you can't learn them you can't practice them you can't do anything towards them except believe god okay and it's cer it's certainly not uh, anything that man can do but rather it is god working by his own power and the greatest miracle of all which i think sometimes we tend to uh, minimize or not recognize and certainly it's not often talked about is the miracle of salvation i keep insisting on reminding us of this because uh, this word miracle remember uh, comes from the greek word dunamis which means power and might uh, and the uh, the miracle of salvation is the greatest miracle because it takes a sinful person that is dead in trespasses and sins and turns him into a live soul that is alive in Christ to do righteousness. That's the greatest miracle. That's the greatest trans transformation you can ever see anywhere. And so if God performed no other miracle in any context, merely the fact that you are saved, you are a walking miracle. Can you see that? And that's glorious. So uh, if, if somebody ever says, well, uh, have you ever worked a miracle? Well, you can say, yeah, God has worked a miracle in me right here. You're looking at a walking miracle. Praise God. Amen. He saved me from sin and I am a new creature. So if you were never healed, and I know that you have been, if God had never provided anything supernaturally, I know He has. If God had ever answered a prayer, you know, and I know He has done all of that, then He has saved your soul. He has performed all the miracles that you will ever need as a reference point to say God is a miracle-working God. Isn't that beautiful? Praise the Lord. So uh, you are able to act supernaturally, and as a new person in Christ, He has given you power uh, to live above sin. So the miraculous transformation begins uh, when you first uh, 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 accept Jesus and it continues and is miraculously manifested in the life of uh, believers in the New Testament through the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Working uh, miracles, something we cannot do in the natural, but we can certainly do through the Spirit of God. This is the next um, uh, a series of uh, gifts that, that the Bible speaks of and actually are the gifts of speaking supernaturally. We're speaking specifically or we're referring specifically to the, uh, the gifts of prophecy, speaking in different tongues and the interpretation of those tongues. So let's have a look at the first one, which is the gift of prophecy. Um, and again, there's much that can be said here, but it is a vocal gift. So uh, distinguished from the others in that it has to do specifically with the speaking, with the voice, and it is a divinely inspired and appointed, anointed utterance, a, a supernatural proclamation 
uh, this, in this sense, it is in a known language. And I've underlined that because uh, prophecy differs from tongues and interpretation in that prophecy is spoken in the local language, in a known language that people comprehend. Okay? So uh, when, when God anoints you to uh, speak and to utter supernaturally in a known language, uh, this is prophecy, and often this prophecy reveals the inner uh, person and the motives of the heart, and it's, it can be both a forth telling, which means to explain forth or to tell a message, or a foretelling, which means to tell something about the future. So it has both capacities, if you please, to say something that is happening right now, uh, that is taking place, and also to foretell uh, something that's to happen in the future. So prophecy has both uh, those um, uh, those abilities. And uh, as an example, we find that um, Jesus speaks, for instance, in the um, second and third chapter of Revelation, speaks of the strengths and the weaknesses of the seven churches in Asia. And uh, again, there is much prophecy that takes place there, both foretelling and foretelling. So if you read those two chapters, you will find examples of what we're speaking of here. In the spirit, God can use you exactly the same way. Usually, this gift is, is given within the church to bring messages to the people of God, but not alone. There are some times when a special anointing comes upon you uh, to actually speak um, to an individual. Now, I want to differentiate here that, uh, that uh, this type of prophecy or this gift of prophecy is not the same as preaching. Preaching uh, presupposes that you have prayed and studied and prepared, whereas uh, prophecy is kind of an immediate inspiration. It is a delivery that comes directly from God, okay? There is no preparation implied. Uh, and it doesn't uh, supplant, it doesn't replace, but it actually supplements the preaching of God's Word. Um, prophecy and, of course, the interpretation of tongues can be judged according to 1 Corinthians 14. In fact, take those scriptures down. Uh, by judged means that we are able to actually uh, you know, tell whether it is of God or not. We can evaluate it. We can, um, uh, you know, we can sort of weigh it out. In fact, we should according to Scripture. And God intends prophecies to be used for edification and exhortation and comforting the people. So please remember that whenever we're used in the gift of prophecy, we're, we're not there to sort of have a go at somebody or, or, or foster our own agenda. We are delivering a message from God and uh, it is uh, through the anointing of the Lord. So, uh, very quickly, prophecy should do three things. It should glorify Jesus, right? It should make certain that everything we say is for the glory of God. It should agree with Scripture. In other words, it cannot be saying something that the Bible does not say. If ever you hear a prophecy that goes against the Word of God, then you know it's a false prophecy. It's not of God, okay? It always agrees with the Scripture. The Spirit of God is not going to contradict Himself, okay? And he is the author of the word of God. And finally, of course, it flows from a life yielded to God. You can't imagine God using someone to prophesy if they're living in sin or if they're living in an in a ungodly, unholy situation. So quite clearly, if God uses uh, an individual, then he's going to use a vessel that is used, uh, yielded to him. I, I do want to cover a point very quickly to make you aware, of course, that in all of the spoken gifts, in fact, in all of the gifts, God uses human instrumentalities. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, humans are flawed. Would you agree? And so it is natural that if, you know, and, and we're kind of unique and, and individuals and we're separate, you know, different from one another. So whenever the Spirit of God flows through it, God, uh, through us, God's Spirit is the same. God's Spirit is powerful. God's Spirit is perfect. But what He flows through is an imperfect vessel. So perhaps at times, in speaking, and it's often seen in these gifts of, of verbalization, but in all of the gifts, you may find an expression that is peculiar to the individual. You may find uh, a coloring or maybe even a grammatical mistake or a, an expression that is an error. That doesn't mean it's not of the Spirit of God. We can't reason, oh, God doesn't make mistakes because God is flowing through a person and that individual is flawed. You understand what I'm saying? So in all of the gifts, there may well be some uh, coloring, shall we say, of the person through which the, 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 the gift is flowing. That said, of course, it is up to us as individuals to make certain uh, that we remain so attuned to God, so 
cleansed and clean, that we are the best possible channel through which God can flow. Okay? So that's prophecy in a, a quick nutshell. And I, as I say, I'm moving through this fairly quickly just to give you an idea of the contents. Uh, the next gift that the Bible speaks of is called diverse kinds of tongues. And again, it's a vocal gift. And it is supernaturally speaking a language that we've never learned or understood. So the speaker has never gone to school and learned this language, but he's able to speak it. Now, he's not able to speak it with comprehension necessarily, but he speaks it nevertheless. Okay, and this is why uh, the, the Lord gives us the next gift, which is that interpretation of tongues. Well, on the day of Pentecost, of course, we see the example of this uh, very, very uh, well, in that uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was given, there were people from all over the world uh, gathered at Jerusalem, and the Scripture specifically says that every man heard them speak in their own language. And they, and they were astounded by this. Aren't all these that, that speak Galileans? How can we hear them, every one of them, in our own language, in our own tongue where we were born? And so they knew that these people hadn't learned the language, and yet here they spoke it. Uh, I need to point out to you uh, that it is the one same s Holy Spirit that energizes the yielded tongue in various ways. Well, uh, there are four different ways that I would like to point out. Again, please take notes if you will. Um, firstly, when we are first filled with the Holy Ghost, we begin to speak forth with other tongues. The initial evidence of the infilling of the, of the, script of the, of the Holy Ghost, the Scripture teaches us, is speaking with other tongues. We see many examples of this in Acts 2, in Acts 10, in Acts 19, and other places where people received the Holy Ghost and they spoke with other tongues. Now, yes, it's true to say that on the day of Pentecost, there were people present and they could hear their own languages, but none of that is recorded in the other instances. So we know this is not just an isolated case just for the day of Pentecost. It was actually something that happened and what we see continues to happen whenever someone is filled with the Holy Ghost. So in fact, we can tell that someone is filled with the Spirit because not only their appearance changes and they're just absolutely filled with the glory of God, but they begin to flow with a, a language that they've never heard before. And it is quite a heavenly language. So the first type of speaking that the Holy Ghost does here is the speaking when we're filled with the Spirit of God. The second uh, type that we find is for personal edification. This is once we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we can go to prayer and we will speak with other tongues. Now again, we don't understand what we're saying, but we feel edified don't we? We feel built up in the Spirit. It's like the Holy Ghost flows through us all over again and we become strengthened and that's personal edification. And again, there are many scriptures that re reference to that. Uh, but then also there is a tongue speaking, if you please, that is specifically the gift that we are talking about here today. And that is a, a message that comes in tongues that is for the church. Now, you've experienced it many times in our congregation where right in the middle of the service and there will be a correct uh, position or timing for it, uh, someone will receive this anointing and they'll speak forth in a tongue. And we all know in the Spirit, this is uh, not just a normal uh, tongue where, where they're talking to God personally, but rather a tongue that is a message for the church as a whole. Usually it is followed by an interpretation. So th there is a a speaking in tongues that is for the edification of the church. I want you to notice something. It's not a different Holy Spirit, and it is not a different speaking in tongues. It's simply a different use of those tongues. Okay? So whether it's the initial in, in feeling or whether it's a personal edification, it's still the same tongues, if you please, but God is using it for different purposes. Okay? I hope that's clear. And lastly, we know from Scripture... In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, it tells us that to speak in tongues is a sign for unbelievers. In other words, if an unbeliever is amongst us and uh, there is some speaking in tongues, they say, what's that? And that's exactly what we want them to say, what God wants them to say. They, wanna, they need to see that it is something supernatural, something that doesn't just happen. People don't just ramble in a language they don't understand. This is of the Spirit of God. Now, what is interesting is that many a times uh, when I have seen um, individuals who have been present in a congregation 
and there's been a, um, a message in tongues, many times the language that we speak that we don't understand is in their own language, just like on the day of Pentecost. And this has happened a nu numerous times. And of course, that person is convinced that the speaker knows the language. And afterwards, they approach them and they start speaking in their own language. And the person says, uh, I don't understand you. And they say, but yes, you do, because you, you, spoke, you said this and this. And, and, and then they go to the person that interpreted and they say, you, you know, and they speak in their language and, and they don't understand them. And so it is a sign to the unbeliever that this is of the Spirit of God. Beautiful, isn't it? And so we need to remember that God uh, wants to uh, move in us uh, with these things. Now, of course, uh, there is another beautiful gift that comes uh, by the Holy Spirit. And it is the interpretation of those tongues. When God uh, gives a tongue which is for the church, it needs to be understood by the church. None of us understand tongues, so God gives us an interpretation. Well, again, this is a, a vocal gift, and it is the supernatural uh, verbalization and interpretation to reveal the meaning of those diverse tongues. Praise the Lord. Okay? Now, we find uh, examples of that, of course, in Paul's instructions. In 1 Corinthians 14, just jot those scriptures down. And uh, what you find is that in this situation, the words that come to your mind and heart are not sourced in your own intellect. They come from heaven. It's like those of you that have been used in that gift. Uh, it's like God gives you the interpretation. You know it's there, even though you don't know every word. And in faith, you step out and God uses you in that gift. And it flows out of you. And God says or interprets what the person spoke in tongues. Um, the scripture also encourages us that we should pray that we may interpret. So if, if, if you uh, desire this gift, you need to pray to God that he will give you the ability to interpret uh, the tongues that have been spoken. And I want you also to remember that it is what the Bible says, an interpretation, not a translation. There is a difference. Okay? A translation usually translates word for word. An interpretation is not so. An interpretation can mean that the tongue is long and the interpretation is short or vice versa, short in, uh, tongue and a long interpretation. Sometimes it can be word for word, but it is not a translation. So what you're hearing in your native language by interpretation isn't an exact translation of the words, but it is what God says it means. And I guess that's why it's called an interpretation. What uh, an important point that I need to make is, and this is a biblically made point, is that when there are tongues spoken in a church and an interpretation, those two things together are equal to prophecy. In other words, prophecy, remember we spoke earlier where a person gets a message from God and speaks in the native language, in the local language, okay? And that's a message from God. Well, tongues and interpretation together are equal to prophecy. So they're the same. So the question that has been asked by some is, well, then why not just prophesy? Why bother with the tongue and then the interpretation, right? So that's the question that is asked. And why then not just prophecy? Uh, can somebody tell me why? What did we say earlier about tongues? Yes, the unbeliever, right? Okay, and so particularly so, it is important that we remember if there is an unbeliever, that tongue being interpreted, so it, it can speak volumes to say, here is a person speaking across here is another, and, and, and it's in the spirit. They, they know what the other person has said, and it's a sign to the unbeliever. So remember that God knows exactly what he's doing. There are times when he will bring forth a prophecy in our native language. Other times it will be a tongue and interpretation, and uh, there are reasons why God does it that way. I'm going to close very quickly by giving you a few um, biblical regulations in regards to the vocal gifts. Uh, for this, you'll have to turn to, uh, and please jot this down, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is dedicated, really, to giving the church instructions on the control and correct use of the vocal gifts in the church. Now, there is a lot of confusion amongst people about these things, and uh, I won't go into too much detail today, but just to give you a very, very quick outline of what um, is necessary. First of all, uh, we need to be careful, according to Scripture, that there is balance in what is done in regards to speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Uh, what we are saying here is that um, it shouldn't be extreme. Uh, many times people just go off on, on the gifts in this sense 
And that's pretty much all that the meeting is about, you know. So you've got to be careful that it is kept in the context of what God is doing, not what man is doing. Please recall this. It is God's Spirit using us, not us using God's Spirit. There's a huge difference. The gifts of the Spirit are exactly that. They're empowerments of God's Spirit through us. And so we need to keep it in that balance. Also to be remembered that all gifts are for edification. Say edification. Say out loud, edification. Amen. Amen. Remember that every gift is to edify the body, is to encourage the body, not to put them down, not to destroy them. There is no personal agenda involved in the gifts of the Spirit. It is God's work, God's purpose through us. Okay? So they cannot be used for anything but being in the Spirit. Edification means that uh, they're there to build up, to encourage, to strengthen. Yes, to correct, but to do it so in a way that is loving and uplifting. Okay? So it needs, of course, wisdom. And, um, and in, in terms of what we, uh, what we say, in verse 20 of that chapter, you'll find that uh, Paul says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. Have wisdom, in other words. Use common sense. And wisdom should always be used uh, as a guide in the operation of the, of the gifts of the Spirit. But also, it must always align with God's Word. Once again, whether it's prophecy, uh, whether it is uh, a tongue and interpretation, or really any of the gifts that we have spoken of today, they must line up with the Word of God. God will never do something or, or say something that is in contradiction to His Word. That's a very good guideline to remember. Here is an important one, and perhaps one that we all need to take note of, particularly if you're being used in the gifts. It's called self-control. The Bible says that the spirits of the prophets are subjects of the prophets. And so it's a case of uh, allowing for the manifestation of God uh, but not to react to it. Perhaps we could illustrate it this way. If you uh, flick a switch uh, on a light, uh, energy flows through and the globe lights up. That to me is the manifestation of electricity. Okay? Now here's the difference. Flick the switch up and then hold on to the wires. Now you're going to get a reaction. Okay? What's going to happen? You're going to get a shock not necessarily a proper manifestation. The right manifestation is what creates light. It's what gives guidance. That's what the Spirit of God inten intends to do. So when the Spirit of God flows through us to use us, we have to make sure that we don't become an impediment to the flow of God's Spirit. We do that by overreacting. Sometimes we are too much in our emotions. Perhaps uh, we can, uh, you know, just that, overreact to the move of what we sense of the Spirit. So allow for self-control here, simply because it's a great and powerful thing to be used of God, but we need to remain in the right place to be used correctly. Sometimes our own emotions can get in the way, and so there is unnecessary uh, well, yelling or uh, shaking or unnecessary e emotional and physical reaction rather than a correct manifestation of God. So make sure that you are used of God the right manner. Again, um, everything should be done in order according to Scripture, not confusion. And uh, I think that you will discover that when it comes to the speaking uh, gifts, the uh, gifts of speaking uh, supernaturally, God knows exactly when to bring them in. So there is a correct timing in, in the meeting to do it. Now, think about it once again. Um, it's, it's rude for us to interrupt each other when so someone is speaking, right? Can you imagine if right in the middle of, of, uh, of someone talking or preaching, uh, there should be uh, you know, a, a cutting across of, of a tie in interpretation? It doesn't fit. God does, is not a, a God of disorder. He's a God of order, not of confusion. And so you will find that whenever God's Spirit is moving, if we flow with God's Spirit, we find that timing. It's usually in a lull. It's usually in between things. There is a usually a sense that God is about to speak. And it's almost like the church knows and we all kind of go quiet as a result. And so I believe that we need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God so that these things are not just taking place, but that they're taking place in the right order without confusion and in the right timing. There are also some important guidelines in the Scriptures in regards to two or three. In any one meeting, there should never be any more than two or three tongues and interpretations of prophecies. 
Now, sometimes there is one tongue and, and, and three interpretations. And sometimes there is, uh, you know, three, interp- three tongues and one interpretation. Any one combination of two or three is acceptable before the Lord. But there should never be any more than three, three things happening in that sense. In other words, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter is established according to the Word of God. So uh, there is more to be said on that topic. But have a look at the Scriptures and it's quite clear what it teaches. Lastly, um, because it's an area that requires reminding and constant teaching it is the responsibility of the leaders the pastors and those that uh, are left in charge of the meeting to make certain that these manifestations these uh, uses or this uh, experience in the holy spirit is uh, conducted correctly so if in fact uh, you're being used by god this way and uh, and you're approached or you're it's discussed with you then please remain teachable before god because we're all learning and growing in these things uh, there are many times when a person has come with questions regarding uh, this pa- these particular gifts. The vocal gifts are, are quite unique in the in the church, and so and they're frequently used. And so the questions have been asked, and we uh, would desire that everyone remains teachable, and uh, and so c- we can all grow together in the things of God. Praise the Lord. Well, God is good, isn't He? He has provided amazing gifts uh, for us to use both. In, in a speaking manner, in an acting way, and also in a way of knowledge. His Holy Spirit is quite unique and amazing. And when you are filled with the Spirit, like we've said before, you are just no longer an average human being. Now you are a Spirit of God-filled human. And that makes you kind of special, not only in the sight of God, but in this world. You're a light set upon a hill that cannot be hid. So please, live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, stay in the Spirit, remain sensitive to the Spirit of God because God wants to use you in supernatural ways. Will you stand with me today? Praise the Lord. Thank you for being attentive. We've taken just a little longer today. We wanted to make certain we finished uh, this particular study. Praise God. Let's close our study in prayer today. Praise God. Brother Mark, can I ask you to close the Bible study in prayer, please? Thank you, Savior. Hallelujah.